Good morning, everybody. Um, that was rotten of me. Moira is actually quite right, because it is partially about white fries. Um, but what I've tried to do um, is pull together a few things that reflect um, what I've been up to in the recent past. Um, firstly, white fries. Um, here's evidence of the benefits in not washing all of your skeletons before you hand them over to a specialist. If you remember, um, one of the burials from the church um, in the nave had this jet and glass bead necklace um, around its neck, um, probably originally a rosary, um, and we had six beads. When they were washing the skull in Aberdeen, which is where the burials are being worked on, they found another three beads. So we now have nine. But not only that, they also found a group of these tiny beads. So you've got jet bead, glass bead, and tiny beads. But Gita Hoffman um, has been working on these beads for me. Um, and she thinks the very small beads are actually from um, a beaded embroidery on a dress. Um, this is a female burial um, in the nave. Um, I now have a carbon date, um, which dates it um, 1440 to 1520 um, at 85% uh, probability. That's around about the sort of date that I was expecting because it does belong to the later phase of the remodeled church um, when the, the Bishop of Dunkeld um, was remodeling the building um, in the 16th century. Um, finding a parallel for the rosary um, has been quite an interesting experience. Um, and one of the best parallels that I've found so far and from the work that Birgit has been doing um, is from Reba in Denmark um, from the Franciscan Friary. I've now had two carbon dates um, from Whitefriars. I was able to get some funding from the Hunter Archaeological Trust for four dates. Um, two of the dates have come back. The first one is the one I've just showed you, which is for the burial with the, the bead necklace around its neck. The second date um, is for an infant burial that has been cut by the insertion of the water supply to the friary. Now, I was interested to see if we could get a feel for when that is being introduced into the friary complex. And the date for that burial is 1436 to 1512. So that water supply is being put in after that date, which again suggests to me that that relates to the remodeling of the church by the Bishop of Dunkeld. Um, they're taking water from Wells Hill. They're bringing it downhill into site, into pipes, and around the whole complex, um, which begs the question, where were the, where were the friars getting their water from before that? I have no idea. Um, presumably, there, there may well be a well um, working somewhere on the site. Which key is it to move on? Sorry, I'm getting old. Um, the, one of the more interesting things from the later end of the archaeology at Whitefriars that particularly interested me is this. When I was back on site um, last year for a couple of weeks um, working in an area where the, the proposed building is being extended into, I found this quite large well um, that had been inserted in a, quite a, a, a square clay-lined pit um, and I thought that was quite curious because it wasn't really like a well I'd ever seen before. Um, as it transpires, it's actually a soak away. And I have found a documentary evidence to Dovecut Land, which is the suburb that grows up in Whitefriars, finally getting a water supply in the 19th century from Perth Waterworks, which is Adam Anderson's wonderful building down in Marshall Place. They're actually pumping water all the way up to Whitefriars, um, which has to be at least uh, a mile, I would think. Um, really nice to see that. I also found another reference where the people living in Dovecote land were complaining about the lack of fresh water. Um, so, I mean, the, the, the arrival of Perth's water supply um, through Adam Anderson's works in Marshall Place is quite an important moment um, in Perth's history. 
um, and in fact was still providing the water supply until about 1965. Um, so always nice to get a, a handle on, on later things going on. Um, oh look, some ceramics. There's a surprise. Um, one project that I've been working on um, with older archaeology um, is this one. This, these are three sites in the Skinner Gate um, that were dug um, in, in the 1990s, uh, one of them slightly earlier than that. Um, all of them developer-funded um, excavations which are being pulled together in one publication. Um, the sites were at Cameron's, which is now Gillis um, Furniture Shop, the model lodging house on the Skinner Gate, um, and on Albert Close, right next to the, or on the line um, of the town wall. Um, looking at the three assemblages of ceramics from those sites has been really interesting. Um, it, it's also meant that I've been able to go back to the museum um, and look at earlier finds um, from the 1920s. Um, so, for example, um, from the model lodging house, we have um, most of this quite sizable um, cooking vessel, um, which is in an East Anglian greyware, um, 11th, 12th century in date. Quite a lot of that material from the high street excavations, um, but not much else from other parts of town. And the Cameron's um, furniture shop site, where we have to dig their new lift shaft for them, um, has produced the most remarkable group um, of imported pottery. Um, it's produced some of the best examples of this material I've seen from Perth. Certainly, um, the highly decorated Low Countries fabric um, on the, on the right-hand side of the slide there, that's one of the best Scottish examples I know um, of that vessel type. Some rather nice uh, North French stuff. And the only stove tile from Scotland that is from a domestic site rather than a monastic one. Um, this is all hinting that there's been quite an important high-status building on that part of the Skinner Gate, which is intriguing because in the Book of Schoon um, in the early 13th century, there is a reference to a stone house on the Skinner Gate, formerly belonging to William de Lynn, King's Lynn, um, who presumably was quite an important merchant um, in the town. So there's a possibility um, that the archaeology that was being found um, on that site relates um, to that stone house um, in the Skinner Gate. Now, very recently, um, I've had a whole run of standing building surveys. Um, these are rapid building surveys in advance of building conversions. Um, and I've grown to really enjoy doing these because it gets you the chance to look at some secular um, architecture in the countryside. Um, which a lot of people maybe don't even realize exists. So one example here, this is the manse at Kirk of Muir, um, which was the manse for the United Presbyterian Church, um, derelict since the mid-1970s, um, and has to be one of the most spookiest jobs um, that I've done in recent years, because you could just push, push open the door, walk in, and it was like somebody had just walked out the day before. Um, and... Some rather nice survivals, this rather nice leaded glass window um, in the stairwell. And I think I'm beginning to become a bit of an, an expert on the archaeology of wallpaper, um, although people may uh, disagree with that. Um, it's difficult to see on the slide, but there's actually a, a nautical theme to the frieze um, running along the top of the wall there. That house is being completely converted. Uh, they've taken the roof off and they're going to refit it inside and put the roof back on. So it was nice to get the opportunity to record all of this internal detail, um, most of which um, is probably late 18th, early 19th century. Um, another one, the Toll House at Barn Hill on the way out of Perth. Um, there is planning permission to build an entirely new house down the hill from the Toll House, to refurbish the Toll House and join that with a corridor to the new house down the hill. So the toll house will retain its appearance uh, and the new house will be hidden um, away down the hill, which I think is, is quite clever. Um, not a very big building, but um, I, I enjoyed recording this as well. And as you can see, the, um, the toll of Jews, which formerly would have been on the front of that building, um, is still lurking inside it. 
Um, and I suggested that they need to get that looked at and possibly conserved. If they're not going to do something sensible with it, it probably end up ought to go into the Perth Museum, um, to be honest. And across from the road from it, I discovered they had their own little raised garden area, uh, probably a vegetable garden with some steps leading up into it. Um, in those days, it was probably easier to cross the Perth to Dundee Road, I would imagine. Uh, back to Whitefriars. Um, you may recall um, from my many lectures on site that one of the most curious things that I got there were this group of burials with bits of wood buried with them. Um, 24 in total, um, split between bits of wood that look like wooden staffs that are laid on top of the burial. Um, green wood, the bark is still visible, but not functional as a staff. So I think they must be symbolic. Um, and then there's a group of burials who have much smaller wooden rods. I have been looking to see if I can find any parallels for this. And this is quite intriguing. There are several sites in England where burials have been found with these types of artifacts. But the best parallels are actually from Scandinavia, um, from Norway, Sweden, uh, and Denmark. In Denmark, these things are known as grave kepper. Um, and again, they're not functional. They, they're symbolic. Um, but the jury is very much out as to symbolic of what. Um, so I'm having quite good fun deciding um, what I'm going to say about that. Um, and the other two dates that I'm still waiting for, one of them is from one of these staff burials. And it will be nice to get a handle on what date they are. Um, because for a while I wondered if they related to an earlier version of that church before the friary was there. But I can see from looking at, looking at my stratigraphy that a few of them are actually much later than that. So maybe they're related more to family burial plots. Um, time will tell. And I'm sure I'll probably have to tell you about it at some stage. Finally, um, as Moira said to you early, um, if you're having trouble sleeping at night, um, it's now available online, TAFAC volume 25. Uh, thank you to all authors uh, and funders for that volume. Thank you very much. <laughs>